guy. Up next, Dolores Cannon joins us. She, as you know, is an expert in past life regression, Nostradamus, life after death, and she's going to be talking about what she says are waves of volunteers who are aliens in human form who are coming here in increasing numbers. Why? Dolores Cannon is next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. Looking forward tonight, Dolores Cannon, a regressive hypnotherapist and a psychic researcher. She records lost knowledge. She's been involved with hypnosis for 40-plus years, exclusively with past life therapy and regression work for 30 years. Now, over this time, she developed her own unique technique, which enabled her to gain the most efficient release of information for her clients and to facilitate instantaneous healing. She's also been a UFO investigator for 20 years, investigating the crop circles in England and accumulating evidence from suspected abductees through hypnosis. And Many, many years ago when I was doing a little local show in St. Louis, Dolores Cannon was one of my guests, but she was also a guest of Coast to Coast AM and continues to be. Dolores, how are you? Well, I'm about as good as I can be. You can expect. I just got back from Russia. <laughs> what do you? What were you doing out there? Oh, I did lectures, and uh, I'm teaching my classes all over the world. I've been to Russia four times in the last year. Dolores, you sound younger now than you did ten years ago. What are you doing? <laughs> well, a lot of it, I think, is just going all the time. I don't have time to grow old. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> still, still down in the Ozarks. Yeah, but, you know, in uh, last month in September, I did a round-the-world trip. And that was the first time I've been to South Africa, and I'm going to have to go back there next year. I'm teaching my classes there also. I was home one week, and I had to go back to a UFO conference in England and then on to Russia. So i am just been home a couple of days, and I'm still getting over jet lag. (laughs) Well, I'm going to push you for three hours tonight. Can you handle it tonight? Oh, I hope so, because okay. I, you know, I still haven't adjusted, and I said, yeah, and this is going to really help, getting my time clock off some more. <laughs> well, if you start fading, you let me know. <laughs> well, that's okay. I can do it. We've got you hooked up to a little electrode, and I can push a button from here. And Will that kinda... zap me and put me out, or what? <laughs> no, <laughs> do that'll, keep, that'll keep you awake. You, okay. you have been, you've been doing some research, Dolores, into what you call three waves of people uh, that you claim to be volunteers who come to Earth, and they've been doing this over 50 years. Explain all of this for me. Oh, boy, that's going to take a little while to explain. That's okay. But, but, you know, I I think most people out there know my work, but I do want to emphasize I don't channel. None of this comes from channeling. This is all from the thousands and thousands of clients I've had over the 30 years. That's where the information comes from. I could never make this stuff up, and I've been accused of everything. (laughs) But, you know, like you said, I've done over 20 years with UFO research, but now it seems like I'm accumulating more and more information that is different, and it's going in a different direction. That's why it's going to go in my new book, The Convoluted Universe, Book 4, all of these new theories I'm finding out now about the UFO uh, case that people don't understand. Now, are you getting this information by traveling all over the world and picking up pieces from people, research, or is it coming to you also? Uh, As you said, you're not a channeler, but you're picking it up from other sources. Yeah, it comes from the people I work with, the clients. They come to me for therapy. Usually it's physical problems, but when I do the session, strange things happen, and information comes out that they have no conscious knowledge of at all. And that's where I get a piece here, I get a piece in England, I get maybe get a piece somewhere else, and I have to put it all together like puzzles. So it is worldwide. Yes, and I think that's why I'm getting more than the average investigator, because it's like a puzzle. I get a piece here, another piece there, and I can organize it where other people are staying in one place working with a few clients, and I don't think they would ever get these theories that I've come across. Okay, now you say that these volunteers have been Uh coming to Earth over the past 50 years. Why why is that, that time period, 50 years, why is that so significant? It is very, very important. But can I go back a little? You know, some of the things I say may upset some people, but I think you're used to that on your show. <laughs> yeah, we, we are. Well, we are. 
the information I've got, some of it was in my first books, Keepers of the Garden and the Custodian, about my first UFO cases. Right. And they started talking about the seeing of the planet Earth. That meant that when life began on Earth, and this is the part that might be controversial to some people, was that the ETs are responsible for life, all life on Earth. This means plant, animal, and human life on Earth. That's how long they've been monitoring us and taking care of us. Because I've never found the negative. It's always been the positive because they've given me all this information. But they, this is something not unique to Earth. Um, they're called The ones that began it all were called the archaic ones. This was ancient, ancient. I mean, eons and eons ago, they were going throughout the galaxies, planting life on every planet that was suitable for life. Was it almost like their job, their mission? Yes, it definitely was. And this was something went on for a long time. There were generations of them. Some had to do, I, and I have had people go back to past lives when they were some of these groups. And that's where I've gotten the information from. There were what were called the planters, the ones who had to do the seeding. And the seeding was on a cellular level. And then there were also uh, the recorders, the ones who had to come and keep records of what was growing and what was not. <clears throat> and then there were others that had to weed things out. So they all had different jobs. Now, so did, none, this, did the none seeding... Of them stayed here all the time. You know, they just came and went. Well, you know, Zechariah Sitchin uh, has, has always talked about the possibility that we were genetically altered. And yes. you know what? It could be very similar to what you're hearing. Well, other people have talked about Zechariah's work, and I know Zechariah. He's a very fine gentleman. But they've talked about his work in comparison to what I've found. What I have found is the Sumerian tablets that his information came along at a later time in Earth's history. Mm-hmm that life had already been seeded, it had already begun. And what Zechariah was talking about is mentioned in one of my books. Later, there were groups that came with the different types of, of an agenda. And they took um, other groups and began to genetically alter them to be slaves. Now, that's a different group altogether. It came along many, many years, ages after the original uh, people were seated. Now the original the original the, the, ori the original seating yeah. was it was it done with creatures let's say that were already on this planet? No. Like okay, okay so it's <laughs> how, no, they, they, be, they began everything. I've had some of my clients go back to when the oceans were made, when the plants were first beginning to grow. See in the beginning earth couldn't hold life. It could nothing could grow here. It was all volcanoes exploding, uh, ammonia in the air, nothing could live. So the first thing that had to be done would be to clear the air and you know change the gas contents into oxygen so that we would be able to have life begin to form of any kind. Once that was done, then plants were brought in. But it was all begun on a cellular level, single-celled organisms. They brought them. This is what they meant by the planting, to see if it would begin to form and develop into a multi-celled organism. didn't matter what kind it was, as long as something began to grow in the primeval soup, the environment of the planet. So they didn't care what it was. But they said life is so fragile, you have no idea how important life is. Sometimes they would come back to check on it and find that even though it began to clump together and form something, it would fall apart, and the planet would be lifeless again. So then they were, you know, they'd have to start all over again or just say, well, this planet is not going to work. So they had to first get plants. Before you have animals and, and intelligent beings, you have something to eat. So the first thing was to grow the plants. Then the animals were also brought in. Many of them were brought from many other planets throughout the solar systems, the galaxies. Huh. They have traveling zoos, really, on these ships. Is that kind of like the Noah's Ark story? Uh, yes, it is. 
because they would bring these from many different places, and sometimes they had to genetically alter them so they could adapt to life where they had to leave them. And it was done simple at first, and then it became more and more complicated. This was a huge um, scientific experiment, I guess you would say. Where did they come from originally, Dolores, the, those that came to seed the planet? Everywhere. <laughs> You'd be amazed. They said these, that was their specific mesh mission, and many of them lived on the craft. Uh, they never went back to the original planet. Some of them had their families on board these crafts, and they just went throughout the galaxies doing this work. It was their assignment. But I've had other people go back to lifetimes on other planets where they were living lives, they were working in laboratories. Uh, they came from everywhere. And in my work, I have found, oh, hundreds of different types of ETs. There are not just a few. And they all have different uh, jobs. All right, Dolores, you stay with us. We're going to take this quick break. Dolores' website, by the way, and let me spell it for you because it's uh, ozarkmount.com, but it's spelled O Z A R K M T. Dot com. We'll be back in a moment. And you know, her belief of this does not negate a divine creator. We'll talk with her about that when we come right back on Coast to Coast AM. And as you know, the Coast to Coast AM app, free to all users of the iPhone and iPod Touch, exciting new way for fans of the show to stay in touch, as well as for Streamlink subscribers to get show audio directly from their mobile device. You probably know about this by now, but if you don't, you can get all the information by going to coasttocoastam.com. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. We've got Dolores Cannon tonight. Dolores, because you said this was controversial, and it is for some who are staunch believers in the Bible and very religious, I, I have not heard you say anything about not believing in a divine creator here. Somebody had to create the cedars and, and those that came around and did what they did throughout these various planetary systems, I assume, right? Uh, yes, and we have a very strong belief in God because in my work, we have had people go back to the source when they were created. This is what they call it, the source, what we call God. Now, you know, to accept everything I'm saying, you have to also understand about reincarnation, and, uh, you know, that those are also controversial beliefs. But I've had many people go back to the beginning when they were created. And this is also in my book, their description of what God is and where we all came from. And so the ETs also came from God. See, that's what we don't understand. You just don't live a body as a human. This is only one school that you go to, and that's all it is, a school. You learn lessons. You've also had lives as ETs, if you want to call them that aliens on other planets and other dimensions, and I've had some go back to where they've gone past ETs to where they were beings of light. So anything is possible, but all of this was they all came from God because we are the real uh, you is your soul, your spirit. Sure. That is the part that was created by God. We'll get into these various waves in a moment, but uh, yeah. you, you, had, you had mentioned earlier these that, that, that all this started, the, 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 the new ones, the ones who've been coming here of late, it's been the last 50 years. So there seems there's a, yeah. there's a reason for that, isn't there? Yeah, let me, let me, we've got plenty of time, so I guess I can build up to that. Is that okay? All right. All right, but one thing about God, the ETs, if you want to call them that, are closer to God than we will ever be because they don't eat. You know, that's one of the things. Their organs have atrophied. They don't have to consume food anymore. These are certain types. And I asked them what they live on. They said they live on light. And I said, where does the light come from? It comes from the source. So without God, they couldn't live. It's absorbed through their body, and this is what keeps them alive. Are they physical? Some of them are. They're very physical. They're just, their organs have atrophied, so they don't function like we are. We do. Some people say they may be even us in the future, which is a possibility also. Well, that is true, too. So there's all kinds of theories. But what they have said is in the very, very beginning, they started the seedings as because God, the source, told them to do it, to go out and begin to populate the world. 
So they're doing it under instructions. So you can say it's a creationist theory and the evolutionist theory combined into one. So neither one uh, is stands alone. It is a combination of the two. Were some of these giants as reported in the Bible? Definitely. That everything in the Bible is true to a certain extent. The part there about the first Jehovah and E.T., you know, that part, uh, that is what Zachariah Sitchin came up with. Those are the ones that came much, much later after the planet was formed. There were life. There was beings here. And they're the ones that wanted to use it for the wrong reasons. So that's the, the uh, beginning of the Old Testament are those creatures that uh, Zechariah writes about. But there were definitely uh, giants in the beginning. They were some people that had blue skin, green skin, purple skin. They were all different experiments, and some of them survived and some of them died out. But when they began, some of the animals were uh, did develop on Earth genetically, and other ones were brought in. But it, they had to find an animal that they could develop into an intelligent being. This took eons of time, but they finally decided that the monkey was the best one. Here again, this may upset people, but they had to have an animal that had hands so they could make tools later mm -hmm. and also have a large brain capacity. So they took the monkey and they genetically modified it to become a human being. And they've told me the missing link will never be found because it jumped generations and species so fast from what they began with until what eventually became Homo sapiens. I asked them one time, I said, didn't life ever occur just spontaneously and indigenously on any planet. They said no, because if they did, it would have been chaotic. It would not have had a plan. They said for you to develop into an intelligent human being, it had happened spontaneously, it would have taken a million more years than it did to have an intelligent being on this planet. So it had to be planned and studied very carefully for, for what was developing. So let's get up and jump to, okay, uh, I know I have a little more to tell before we get up to 1950. Uh, in the beginning, they said, let's give this beautiful planet a creature with free will and see what he does with it. And believe me, they're not very happy with what we're doing with it. It was their choice. Yes, just to see what they would do with it. And we were supposed to be a perfect species that would never get sick and never die. It was like in a virtual Garden of Eden was what it was supposed to be like. And everything was developing along and going very well until something happened to spoil the experiment. A meteorite hit the Earth, and what it did, it brought a bacteria that was, not, uh, was alien to the Earth. And the bacteria, for the first time, developed disease to the Earth and it contaminated the growing species. And at first there was a lot of sorrow and sadness. They said, what do we do now? They went back to the councils, and there are councils over solar systems, galaxies. They're the ones that set the rules. They went back to the council and they said, what are we going to do now? Our experiment is ruined. Do we just destroy everything and start oh. over again, or do we let it continue developing on its own? It was decided that so much time and effort had been put into it to allow it to continue to develop. And monitor it maybe every once in a while. And this will help people understand what the ETs have been doing up into our modern time. It's not invasive. It's not negative. They've been keeping track of us and watching us because we're their children. And they said the human species is so important it must not perish. So the idea that they're here to take over the world doesn't uh, fit into this at all. It's just misunderstandings of people. But along the way, as the species began to develop, it needed different, um, uh, what do you want to call it, inventions along the way, different things to help the species go, like the uh, mention of fire, mm -hmm. the being taught how to plant. 
Now, every culture in the world has the legend of the culture bringer. They always have someone, the corn woman with the Indian, someone who brings agriculture, someone who brings fire. Some kind of knowledge. To and them. they always come in the legends from the sky or from across the waters. That's true. These are the ones who came to teach the development species. And they lived among them. And because they could live as long as they wanted, they were treated as gods. And these are the legends of the gods that have come down to us through all the cultures. Were the ETs living among them, teaching them the different things? And I told, I asked them, well, oh yes, the Star Trek, uh, you know, the Star Trek um, directive of non-interference, yes, is very, very real. It's not fiction. Once this was set up, give them free will. You cannot interfere in the developing development of a, a civilization. No matter what. No matter what. Except there is one exception, and that's what I'll get into during the show. This is why they had to take action. But you cannot develop into the, the development of the species. You cannot interfere. So all they could do was watch and see what we were doing and shaking their heads. But I said, well, what about when you come and give them fire, you give them corn, you know, the uh, planting, Every time something was needed, someone would come and give it to the human race. Sure. I said, isn't that interference? They said, no, we give them to them one time as a gift. They see that as advancement, I would guess. And yes, advancement of the species. What you do with it is up to you. That's the free will. And often they said the way the human species is, you would turn it into a weapon or you would turn it into something was not intended to be. And I said, couldn't you come back and say, you're not doing it right? They said, that's interference. So that's the difference between giving them something and then interfering. But now we have developed to the point they can't come and live among us anymore. Why not? So, well, because, you know, they, they would be noticed. You know, they would be interfering in that way if somebody would know they were here. All right. So if it's time for an invention or an advancement to come into our history, the idea is put into the atmosphere so that whoever thinks of it will be the one to invent it. And it's spread all over the world. So, you know, you always hear about paper, many people working on the same invention at the same time. Mm -hmm. and they don't care who invents it as long as it is invented in the timeline. So that's how we're getting our information now. So they basically put this information out into the universe, basically, and, and, let, never, and let it grow. You know, people get a brilliant idea in the middle of the night, a dream, or all of a sudden an insight. And I've talked to many people all over the world who are working on free energy. And it's all the same devices, but it's as though they're all picked up the idea at one time, this kind of thing. If it's meant to be, it will be, it will happen in our line. Did they have this problem with free uh, will on other planetary systems or just this one? This one is very, very special. Some of the other planets, see, I've had people go to lifetimes when they were on these other planets there are some planets that have no free will, and it's horrible. Hmm. And, and other planets have a different kind of lesson, and it's not as hard as ours. They said Earth is a very challenging planet. They're really afraid of us. They're afraid of our violence. They said this is a young planet that's been isolated over here in this part of the galaxy on purpose. They don't want us to contaminate the rest of the developing species because of our violence. Are they puzzled by the violence, Dolores? They don't understand it. They said, how can you, you kill each other? That's because life is so sacred. They can't understand that, but they can only observe. So they've been watching us all of this time, monitoring, just to see, you know, because there are records that are being kept in the histories uh, of each planet has a history, and this is in the councils. And when life is, when a planet reaches the point it can have life, that's a very important point in the, the history of that planet, and that's when they're given their life charter. So they keep records of everything that is happening to the, the whole planet. 
And I'm beginning to see a picture here of why they started showing up again 50 years ago. And some of the years. people who they talked about having these implants up in their nostrils, that is because they are recording everything that is being heard and everything that is being seen. It all goes into the computers and the history books on the, their channel, on their um, the home council. Okay, so anyway, they've been monitoring us and watching us and shaking their heads. At these little kids, what are they doing now? And we were given, and you know, the different inventions as mm -hmm. it was time for us to have it. What caught their attention was the explosion of the atomic bomb, 1995. Which they didn't give us, right? No, they said we did not give you them that uh, information. It, they were not supposed to have it. It was too powerful. The human race was not ready for it, and it really got their attention because they said they won't know what to do with it, and it could blow up the world. Now, that's the exception I mentioned earlier. Only if we get to the point where we could destroy the world would they have to step in. Because if the world was destroyed, it would send reverberations out through space, and it would interfere with other planets, other galaxies, other dimensions, and it could never be allowed to happen. Is that why we hear stories of craft being above um, atomic uh, weapons, uh, arsenal sites, and they're dismantled, for example? Uh, well, they are monitoring all of that, and I know, you know Bob Dean, yeah, he, he is. He's a good friend of mine. He has talked about where they have. He's heard the stories where they have appeared to different um, government leaders right when they were making these atomic plans to keep them from moving forward. And I believe Bob. He has a lot of information. Would they ever destroy us, Dolores, in order to stop us? Now, like you said in the beginning, they said, "Let's let it evolve. Let's let it happen." They had a chance to wipe us out. Would they do it this time? No, because they said life is too special. This is part of the collection of sperms and ova. They're stored. In case the human race were to destroy itself, they could reproduce us. And there's another planet out there, they said, that we could move us to if we had to be. Hmm. And if we could develop on that planet all over again from scratch. But it's a planet that is a little different than Earth, but it has the same chemical composition in the gases in the air. Mm -hmm. But this is just in case, and they don't want us to go that far. The but, alien abduction phenomenon that we hear so much about, are they part of that? Definitely, but it has a definite reason. Okay, would, you can, Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I'm talking over you. I don't mean to. Um, like I said, when the atomic bomb was dropped, that really got their attention, and they had to come down here, see what these kids are up to, what are they mm -hmm. playing around with. And you remember at the end of the 1940s and the beginning of the 1950s is when they began the rash of the first UFO sightings. That's right. That's when it all began, because they had to come and see what was going on. As a matter of fact, 1947, Kenneth Arnold, 1947, Roswell. Yeah. It all, it all started but just a year or two after the atomic bomb. Before that, you only heard of a few things, just, you know, isolated uh, stories and things before. that. It all began with the atomic bomb because they had to find out what we were up to and was very important, not just for Earth, but for the galaxies and everything. So when they found out what we were doing... They became very concerned because they said, these kids can't even handle their own affairs. Look at the war they just came through. Look at the things they're doing to each other, the violence. They can't even handle that. They, they'll never be able to handle an atomic power. So they were very concerned, what are we going to do to ourselves? So they went back to the council. They said, I said, couldn't you just come in and say, stop it with the atomic power? They said that's interference, and, and they are bound hmm. by that. So they came up with what I think is a brilliant plan that I don't think anyone else would have ever come up with but the ones who created us. Do we have time to me tell it right now, or do you want um, to? We've got, we're coming up on a break in a minute, and I'm sure this is, okay. is going to be but a big part. I think it would be a good holding point. 
But they went back to the council and discussed this. They said, all right, we cannot interfere from the outside. What if we do it a different way from the inside? I wonder who concocted that idea. <laughs> the ones <laughs> in the council. So this is what will bring me up to the, th the three waves of volunteers. Okay, we'll talk about these three waves when we come back, Dolores. And uh, Dolores, of course, also has uh, been just uh, an expert with Nostradamus and her past life work as well. We'll get into that a little bit later on on Coast to Coast AM. Her website is uh, ozarkmt.com, ozarkmt.com. And if you need to email me, that's george at coast to coast AM com as well. So we'll be right back in just a moment. Fast Hour, Dolores Cannon. Next, on Coast to Coast AM. We're hearing an incredible story from Dolores Cannon, and we'll be back with more in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. So, Dolores, they had a plan, huh? Okay. Um, yeah, one thing I would like to say, one of the reasons the other investigators and other hypnotists are not getting the information I do is because they work in the lighter levels. In my technique, I work in the deepest possible level of trance, which is called the somnambulistic level. At that level, the conscious mind cannot interfere. It is totally out of the picture. The person doesn't remember anything when they awaken. Okay. So you can see we can get a lot better information than at the lighter levels of trance. And how many people in the trance state will tell you this? Uh, what, what percent? Really? All of them? Oh, boy. No, that's the, that's the beauty of this technique that I've developed is that 90% of the people go into the deep trance. And my main concern is uh, helping them with their problems as a therapist and the counseling and also the physical problems. But during the session, this kind of information comes out. Because what I'm finding now, this is what I'm going to go into, instead of going into a past life, which we used to do, Right. Whenever, that's the, how I began. I always take the person to their to an appropriate past life to explain their problems. Guess what it used to be? You'd go to a past life. Not anymore. Now they either go back to God when they were created or they go to when they were on spacecrafts, other planets. It's a whole new thing developing. The okay. only ones who go to past lives anymore that I work with are those who still have karma to be repaid. So I see a whole new um, trend happening here that the other ones don't see because they don't work like I do. Okay, now right before the break, you yep. were telling us about how they had a plan to try to fix this. Yeah, they had to come up with something to save us from ourselves. We're, we're the bad guys in the whole picture. <laughs> we got to save. <laughs> we don't even realize what we're doing. They got to save us from ourselves. Okay, now. Like I said a few minutes ago, Earth has been stuck in this uh, reincarnation wheel for eons. You know, for eons. You know, people, you don't just have one life. You have hundreds and hundreds of lives. And if you've been on Earth for hundreds and hundreds of lifetimes, you're stuck in the reincarnation wheel, going round and around, making the same mistakes again and again, and not knowing how to get off of it. You just come back with the same people, same circumstances, and that's the whole problem. So they knew the people here who were stuck in this cycle were not going to be able to solve the problem because of, you know, that's where the violence comes from, that's where the wars, mm -hmm. keep making the same mistakes again and again. So their plan, which I think was brilliant, was let's bring in other souls, pure souls who have never known Earth life, who have never been on Earth before, who have not known the violence and are not stuck in karma. Let's get pure souls coming in. Maybe they can do something to turn the whole cycle around. Are you following me? And, and when did they start doing this? Right it, after? Right after that, with the thought okay. in the 1950s, early 1950s is when it all began. And what they did, they put out a call to the universe. Does anyone want to volunteer and come and help Earth? 
and they said they had meetings, and I've had many, many of my clients have gone back instead of going to past lives, go to when they were having these meetings, and they were discussing it. Who wants to go and help? And they said, I've had them say, I foolishly raised my hand and said I would go. Not <laughs> so, a lot of takers, though, I bet, huh? Oh, definitely. But that's the problem. When you come into Earth life, you don't remember what you volunteered for. Everything is wiped out when you're born. But that's true of everybody. None of yeah. us know our past lives. We don't know why we came. We don't know our association with other people. So it makes it harder. But I asked them one time, would it be easier if we remembered why we came? We remembered what we were here for and our association with other people. They said it wouldn't be a test if you knew the answers. So you have to come in just totally blacked out and start all over again and learn it as you go along. So I had people, instead of going to past lives, like some of them would go back to where they had never left God. They had never mm -hmm. left the source. We all began there and went out and wanted to explore and wanted to learn. Some of them didn't. It was It's so beautiful there. And I can tell you what God is like. I can tell you all of that if you're interested. Well, we'll get to that. You want to get to that later then? Or what? Yeah. Now, the what? I'm, I'm I'm curious with okay. these. Okay, but some the of them go back to Hold that. Hold on, can you can you hear me? I'm yeah. curious with the waves of people. Okay, that's who what I'm came here. To now. Are they are they humans or ETs? They're humans, but their souls are either ETs or they have never had a body before. They've come direct from God. All right. But the ones who were ETs were those who were on spaceships, on planets, other dimensions, and they sent out the call because I've had people while they're under talking about when they came and what they left they were so happy with they were happy on the other planets they were happy when they were with God and I said then why did you come to earth they said we I heard the call and this has happened time after time after time with my clients they say I heard the call I knew I had to come earth was in trouble I volunteered now, why would this be repeated through hundreds of people if there wasn't something to it? Now, what are the things they would try to do to help us? To live among us, to change us by living among us. Would they get involved politically? I mean, would we know? I mean, would there be one of them living next door to you, for example? Oh, and very likely, because they look just like you. Okay. They have no conscious memory of what, where they came from. So they're not here to corrupt anything. They're not here to cause any problems. We don't want to go on a witch hunt looking for these people because now there are tens of thousands of them all over the world. They said, finally, we have tipped the scale. We think we can save the earth by the sheer number of these souls that have no karma. They have, they have no reason to, um, well, what I want to say, they really didn't have to be here at all. They just came. But that's where the three waves come in. And when I first wrote about this in Keepers of the Garden, that was 20 years ago. Now I get letters because the books are translated all over the world. And they all said, I didn't know that was what it was. I didn't know why I felt the way I do. And now I understand and I can live with it. You said the first wave that many of them tried to commit suicide. How come? Yes, because they, they, they didn't like it here. They couldn't adjust. Okay, let me explain now. If we, I don't know when you're going to go into another break here. Oh, wait, um, you got time. You got time. What? You've got time. Okay, the three waves that I found. The first wave that they must be now in their early fifties, their forties or their early fifties, because the first one I discovered had just turned thirty years old, and that was twenty years ago, and I'm still in touch with him. Now this wave. When they came in, these are the people, they don't want to be here. They don't like it here. They can't stand the violence. They want to go home, but they don't know where home is. They just know it's not here. They're very gentle people. These are not conspirators. They're not people who want to hurt anyone. They're just here to change by existing, by being here. So they are 
living among us just as ordinary people, but it's very, very difficult for them because they feel out of place. You can understand why. Mm -hmm. Because the ones I've talked to, this is all over the world. They said they have a good family. They had a good job, but they just didn't want to be here. They wanted to go home. And many of them did try to commit suicide, especially in their earlier years, because they just couldn't take it here. Interesting. But after I worked with them and they find out why they're here, then they change. And they said, all right, I may not like it here, but I'm going to do my job. This is the first wave of people. And uh, I've run into them now all over the world when I lecture on this. Even in South Africa a few weeks ago, two women came up to me afterwards and they said, now I understand why I've felt like this all my life. Now I know what I have 